My name is Roger Berkowitz, and I uh, thank you for joining us for uh, this session of the Hannah Arendt Center's virtual reading group. Uh, as I imagine you know, we're reading uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, essay, Reflections on Little Rock. Um, I shouldn't have to say this is a very controversial essay. It's probably her most controversial and notorious essay, one that um, has largely been ignored until recently uh, when there's been uh, some renewed interest in it. A new book came out uh, a year and a half ago called Hannah Arendt and the Negro Question by uh, Catherine T. Gines. Uh, this is the book. Um, I have a review of it coming out. Um, I don't think the book does Arendt's uh, uh, real justice, but um, it's certainly a start. And I hope that much more research will be done um, into the question of Arendt and race. It was a topic that she spent, I think it's not an exaggeration to say, her entire life thinking and writing about. Uh, she, was, uh, she was a Jew who suffered anti-Semitism in Germany, was in a camp in France, and uh, suffered discrimination in the United States. And at all periods of her life, wrote about um, that and called it the race question. Something we often forget in the United States is that most of the world um, has understood racism and the race question to be a religious question, not a color question. It's primarily in the United States that racism has been understood as a color question. And something Arendt began to do immediately upon arriving in the United States is to try and transfer uh, her understanding of race as she understood it through Jewish matters and, re and religious matters to the American context. And I think one of the most important questions that we can ask, and I think it's an, and, and I think it's one of the reasons we need to study our end on this is to what extent that transfer is legitimate. Um, I think there's ways in which it is and ways in which it's not. She herself in this essay emphasizes one important difference uh, between the two questions. Uh, one and that and that is that whereas Jews and other immigrants are often audibly visible and to a certain extent visibly visible. They're not nearly as visibly visible as, um, as, as people with different uh, skin colors. Um, uh, and, and that visibility for her, which she emphasizes uh, on pages um, 199 of the text, if you're using the text from Responsibility and Judgment where it was republished, um, is, an, is an important difference. Uh, I'm hoping some of you have had a chance to both read the text and listen to the lecture I, I gave on it in, in Paris uh, last year, or actually earlier this year over this in, 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 in March. Um, and maybe we'll start by saying, uh, opening it to comments or questions. All I ask is, uh, we're, we're happy to be critical. Um, let's just try and have a respectful conversation about a very difficult topic. Um, so uh, please turn off your mics if you're not speaking, but if you want to speak, turn on your mics and uh, let's start it off. Are there any comments or questions on this essay? I'm Caroline Paulson, and um, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Uh, I can hear you, but if you could try and speak up a little bit, maybe closer to the computer, that would be great. Okay. Um, I, I was raised in New York, but I spent uh, a lot of time in rural Texas, and I had a black mammy, uh, just like back in the old Civil War days. And uh, her name was Eunice, and I loved her insanely. My younger brother loved her insanely. And she, um, every once in a while, she would take us to the movie theater, but she would put us in this little kid's room, and then she would have to go up to the balcony with the black people, and my brother would get hysterical at this because he didn't want her to leave. 
and he didn't understand it. And, uh, you know, this is like a real crossover between the private and the social, uh, where, and, and she would sit there and say, Carl, you're going to get poor old Eunice in a lot of trouble if you go on like this. And so I just thought, since nobody else was speaking up, I would tell this little story about the private and the social uh, and how painful it is at times. Um, thank you. And uh, if you could turn your mic off now, so we don't get a feedback. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm happy to have people comment on it. I want to say one thing right off the bat, which is, uh, so Hannah Arendt makes this distinction that I, I, I imagine you're all somewhat familiar with between the public, the social, and the private. Um, and it's a distinction that has been uh, heavily criticized uh, on a number of levels. Um, the first real group to criticize it in her, in the Arendt world, were the feminists, feminist Arendt scholars, uh, uh, who challenged the idea of public versus private distinctions. And, and recently it's been very critical, criticized by people writing about her race, race uh, work. Um, and I'm happy to go into it. I'd actually like to, I think it's an important uh, aspect of her work. But one thing I just wanna point out is that for her, movie theaters would be clearly public. Um, she, she makes a distinction between um, social venues where you go to congregate like a resort and hang out with other people like yourselves and 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 places like buses or or restaurants or, or or stores where you go to use them but you don't go to congregate and associate with other people and since at a movie theater um uh you're you're not going to sort of congregate you're going simply to watch a movie um from her point of view this would be public and as a public venue it would be something that would have to be um uh, open to all citizens in an equal level. And so um, the real um, horrors that I think your um, nanny uh, or uh, suffered uh, in, and I think they are horrors. I mean, the, 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 I mean, one thing that is absolutely imperative for all of us to understand is the psychic destructive pain of, of discrimination. Um, Arendt talks about it in many of her writings, in, in her book, The Jew is Pariah, um, uh, but also even in, 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 in her essay, The We Refugees, but even in this essay, um, she says that it's often uh, the psychological uh, pain of discrimination is often worse psychologically and more traumatic than the um, political pain of, of segregation. Um, and she, she recognizes that pain. Um, she simply thinks it's dangerous to, uh, to confuse the social and the political worlds. But it would be, it is important to realize that things like restaurants, movie theaters, and stores for her are definitely public and therefore would be any kind of um, legal or even um, social discrimination would be a violation of the constitutional principle um of 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 equality i just want to make sure that's clear roger howard here uh kind of on a different slant on uh, uh your 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 lecture and this idea of uh people who have things in common uh wanting to be together uh, uh, and defining that commonality in terms of religion and race. It, it, it was interesting to me to, to understand, to, you know, looking at the world today, the Bosch Belt is no more. New York Times this week ran an article that the Irish Alps, which was an area about 20 or 30 miles north of the Bosch Belt, is disintegrating. Uh, and these enclaves to my knowledge, anyway, have not been reestablished in a different location. So I'm wondering, uh, yes, we still have discrimination, and, 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 and yes, it's, it's wrong for a huge variety of reasons. Uh, 
But are we really experiencing change, perhaps for the better, with respect to how we interact with people who are different than us? So, Howard, to me, that's one of the. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's a question that we all need to ask in our lives and in our work and uh, and amongst our friends and amongst our peers. Um, I happen to believe RN can be helpful, certainly not dispositive in, in framing and, 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 and helping to push that question. Um, uh, I think you're right uh, that um, we are seeing um, the, that, that you know, the United States really was built on a principle of equality that was not actualized certainly not realized uh, in the social world, not even in the political world uh, at its beginning. And it is being um, increasingly realized uh, for many people, not at all fast enough. Uh, and those are all legitimate uh, claims. Um, one of the questions you raise though is, um, what, do we, what does that mean? And what do we do with that? And so I, I'll point you to a, 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 a passage on page 200 that to me is, is, is quite um, important here. And uh, I'm going to just read a little bit of it. It's on page 200 in the middle, it starts. Um, and she says, in its all comprehensive, typically American form, equality possesses an enormous power to equalize what by nature and origin is different. So, I mean, I think that's clearly what equality can do is say, look, rich and poor are different, and yet we can make them equal in some ways, and we give them all the right to vote and other civil rights and other and, and, and basic rights. Uh, same with Jew and Gentile, same with colored and non-colored. I mean, and I use color, people of color and, 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 and white. And same with people within people of color and same within white. So we can equalize what by nature and origin is different. Um, but the principle of equality, she continues, even in its American form, is not omnipotent. It cannot equalize natural physical characteristics. And this comes back to what I said before. There are certain ways in which even if we give you equal rights, Simply the way we appear, the way we look, whether we're tall or short, muscular or chubby, uh, male or female, colored or not colored, uh, all sorts of differences, whether we wear a veil or, or not, um, uh, all sorts of differences um, will make it harder, make it difficult, if not impossible, for equality to ever be complete. And she writes, this limit is reached, this limit of equality, um, when inequalities of economic and educational condition have been ironed out. So if we, if we gave everybody the same money or basically the same amount of money and same amount of education, we still wouldn't be equal. Um, and it, but at that point, she says, we reach a danger point. But at that juncture, a danger point, well known to students of history and barely invariably emerges. The more equal people have become in every respect and the more equality permeates the whole texture of society, the more will differences be resented. The more conspicuous will those become who are visibly and by nature unlike the others. It is therefore quite possible that the achievement of social, economic, and educational equality for the Negro may sharpen the color problem in this country instead of assuaging it. This, of course, does not have to happen but it would only be natural if it did. Um, to me, this is really one of the um, most important and, and provocative uh, aspects of, of, of the essay. And it comes to your question about the Borscht Belt and everything. We have, we have many people, and I would say the majority of this country has made a decision, right? One that most of us, many of us support, um, which is that we should, uh, increase equality to the greatest extent possible and minimize um, our differences. Uh, and um, there's a lot to, to recommend that, and Arendt is not opposed to it. But what she's saying is, if anything, 
history teaches us, it's that as we do that, as we minimize these differences, there's always going to be some differences. And because we see ourselves as equal and increasingly see ourselves as equal, those differences that exist will, will, will become more uh, unjustified and lead to more resentments and lead to um, dangerous situations. Um, that doesn't, there's no, there's no conclusion that follows from that. It doesn't mean we should make ourselves more equal or less equal or anything of that sort, but it does mean we have to be aware of that. And I think in many ways we have seen that happen over, you know, the time, over time, that the more equality we have, um, has, and we have become a much more equal country, not, I mean, certainly around the Jews and other, other, other examples, as you just mentioned, the Irish, but also amongst blacks and African Americans, um, the more possibility there is for real uh, resentments to emerge that can be dangerous. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, 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 and that's, this is a point she makes in a number of her books. Um, and what does one make of it? Well, it means that we have to be aware of it. We have to be on the lookout for it. And we have to um, attempt to understand those people and those resentments um, and engage them. Uh, I think that to me is is the number one lesson uh, instead of uh, and not simply just um, yell at them and uh, make fun of them, but under try and attempt to understand the resentments. They come from somewhere deep and they need to be uh, uh, engaged rather than simply um, uh, sought to be like embarrassed or 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 or, or, or swept under the rug. But I assume people might have uh, uh, might have um, ideas here, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this question. Roger, uh, can you? If I can join. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the first five minutes, so I don't know how you were structuring the whole discussion. But I, uh, I found this. Uh, we're talking about sort of what I consider to be fairly straightforward stuff: uh, Jewish families going to Grossinger's, Irish people going to O'Neill House in Durham, and uh, other things like that. I found that was, was the most trivial part of what she was talking about. Um, I found this, uh, she wants to come to a conclusion that uh, dealing with segregation and education was the wrong way to go. And that's the part that I found to be most discussable in this article. Um, she, she attempts to break down reality by parsing it in many different ways that we can't disagree with political, social, uh, legal, Eagle and so on, um, and I was kind—I of, was very disappointed. Uh, now you can have an opinion. She certainly had a right to have an opinion that that was the wrong tack to take, namely uh, worrying about segregation and education. I, I disagree with her, but that's a legitimate opinion on her side. But her basis for her opinion, I found to be very weak and 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 uh, uh, kind of creating a fog of of things that had really. Uh, avoided the moral issue that was involved in segregation, and and that was that's basically my thought on the article. I'm I'm happy to uh, hear, but does someone else was trying to speak? Maybe I'll let two people speak and then respond or get some conversation going. Uh, this is Paul. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, Paul. We hear you. I can hear you. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, to me, uh, especially in light of today's uh, political discourse, what seemed to be most remarkable is uh, her her principal defense of discrimination in the social sphere, um, and uh, her recognition that at least what I see is that there is a a contradiction between freedom and equality. Uh, that uh, by definition, freedom leads to uh, unequal results. And that's something that um, seems in my mind in this, this age of people having to examine themselves for uh, any hidden signs of racism that they may harbor that they're not aware of. I think it's an important corrective. 
Okay, let me let me uh, try and 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 respond to both um, uh, Patrick and Paul's uh, points, which I think are both good and and even you know they they think they're from they're coming from different sides, but um, I think they they do, as Patrick said, bring us to the heart of the matter here uh, of of this text. Um, uh, so she is making an argument. Um, that enforced desegregation um, uh, was uh, a mistake. Um, uh, I, so I just want to be clear in saying that that she um, was not she was in favor in strong favor of um, the uh, the elimination of legal segregation, uh, and in fact she thought and says it here that the uh, uh, attack on legal segregation in the United States in in the 1950s and early 60s did not go far enough, and that while uh, they did um, uh, make it, uh, they did outlaw segregation, legal segregation in voting and in schools, um, they didn't do it, for example, in laws of marriage, which she thought was uh, abominable and perhaps, from her point of view, the greatest violation of human rights uh, of all those uh, aspects of segregation. But um, she is in favor of the outlawing of legal segregation in all of these areas, including education. Um, as both Patrick and Paul said, she then um, gets into this uh, distinction between public, social, and private. And um, I think there's, uh, I think here we have the heart of the issue. There are those who simply say, this is hair splitting. This is, uh, um, this is. I think well, I forget exactly how Patrick phrased it, but you know, these are you know interesting distinctions, maybe in the abstract. But I think his point is, in reality, um, it's sort of a, a a lack of judgment, a lack of moral judgment to take the position uh, she took. And, and let me say, I think that's a legitimate view here. Um, she may simply have been wrong. Um, but uh, her attempts to make that case are, um, I think, uh, worthwhile. And I think actually, and this is where I think Paul's insights are, 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 are helpful and right on, they, 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 they develop certain language that um, might be helpful in clarifying the conversation around race in this country, um, and 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 helping us to 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 move it forward in a productive ways, and 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 as a background to that, let me just say that Arendt really worried and predicted that the forced desegregation of schools would worsen race relations, um, not make them better, and I mean, fifty years, seventy years of desegregation. Uh, of schools has led to a lot of consequences in this country, uh, one of which is that schools in many places are more segregated now um, than they were uh, at the time of these decisions, or as segregated, and uh, not more segregated, I apologize, as segregated, and um, and that, you know, there were huge resentments in Boston and, and elsewhere around these ideas of, of, of forced desegregation. And so, um, and, and, and that for the most part, the white families that have had their schools desegregated are not the wealthy liberal white families. They're the poorer working class white families where this was less popular. Um, uh, and we just should point out that that meant much of this was borne by um, by those people uh, least ready to to bear it. So, um, what is this distinction? Uh, between public and private, and why does she put and, and public and social and private, and why does she put schools in in the social? Um, the first thing to note is that what she says is that education is traditionally a private right, not a social right, and not a public right. It is the right of a parent to choose how to raise their child, and she takes that as a very important starting point. Um, and she says that that's a right that parents of children have had from time immemorial. 
Um, and she doesn't think that education should be used as a political uh, um, uh, device or as a utopian device to create uh, uh, a utopian society. If we're going to do that, she says, we have to follow Plato's lead and remove children from their parents. Because if you don't, you create a situation in which the, stu the t school teaches one thing, the parents teach another, and you turn the kids against their parents. And um, she found that, she finds that to be a violation of the parental right of, of raising one's child. And, um, and she finds that a, an attack on the kind of privacy and the world of uniqueness and exclusivity uh, that is held in private. Um, the school is uh, a mixed institution. And I think there's two ways to read the school. A lot of her critics read the school as a public institution. It's a public school. And it's designed to um, uh, not simply to educate our kids, but to um, uh, in, indoctrinate or teach them or mold them in certain public American values. And um, I think to me, the most promising and convincing line of rebuttal of RN's text is to challenge this idea that schools are social and to say that they're not. In the United States, um, schools play a political role uh, as opposed to an educational role, which is that in a country in which there is not one uh, 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 nationality or ethnic group, but there are many, um, schools become the, 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 the sort of cauldron, the melting pot, to use a, uh, that metaphor, where we um, make out of many one. Um, Arendt is very wary of making out of many one. She doesn't believe in the melting pot metaphor because um, she sees that as another, way, another definition of tyranny. Um, to make out of many one means to uh, have a, a, a dominant cultural opinion and impose it um, ideologically on, uh, on others. And so um, what she says is that uh, while education is fundamentally a private right, parents can then choose where to send their school ch children to school, and that's a right of association which is a right that belongs in the social and that schools are social institutions. I should say that in another one of her essays, The Crisis of Education, she offers a different view, right? Which is that in America, schools are not just social institutions, they're also political institutions, and part of their role is to um, uh, um, socialize students into an American ethos. To me, that's the best criticism of her of her argument. And it's a criticism um, that would work on her own terms. And, uh, and I think it's, 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 it's meaningful. Um, so we have to, you know, I think we have to have a discussion about whether we think it's schools should be public or private. The consequences of that criticism and that consequences of insisting that schools are public instead of social is to say that we are willing to say that there are public values that we are willing to um, indoctrinate students with, even if those values um, uh, will fundamentally contradict the world of the parent and community that those students are, are, are come from, which means that we will, in a sense, say um, that for parents who believe certain things, we, in a sense, will deprive them of their right to raise their children in their belief system and in their way of, of thinking. And if we're going to do that, we should be clear about what we're doing. Um, we would become, in our end's language, something more like a tyranny. But if you want to use a, a less offensive word than that, we would become more like a nation state. We would become more like a state in which there is a single national idea that we require and impose upon everybody. Um, one of the things she values deeply about America is that it's one of the few countries, in fact, she thinks the only country at the time, 
that's not a nation state. That fundamental principle was not about creating uh, a single national identity, but was about um, creating uh, a country that allowed different groups, different identities, uh, different worlds to exist and coexist um, together freely without having to each uh, accord with one single um, national ideal. Um, that was what she found unique, exceptional, and um, completely freeing uh, about the United States. And it was that ideal that she was trying to preserve here. So let me stop. I mean, I, there's much more to say. I, I'm just trying to help us understand her arguments and what's at stake in them. And I'm happy to have people comment on them. Hi, Roger. Um, I have a sort of a question on that, because I, it seems to me that maybe um, Hannah Arendt left something out of her analysis um, in that she she mentions maybe one of the two racial questions of rooted in American history, but she completely overlooks um, American Indians who did go through this exact process that you're describing of removal from the parents, sort of the tyranny that's imposed on them. Um, and so I'm wondering if if we took that aspect into consideration, if that sort of changes the analysis at all. Thank you, Daniel. That's it's a it's a great question, and and it's one that um, uh, uh, you know you you can't but think about when you when you read her work. Um, uh, I would say this: um, the the main difference between there's two main differences between the American Indians uh, and the and and, and American um, blacks. Um, one is the question of visibility that uh, I talked about earlier. Um, you know, there's some visibility issues with Native Americans, but m much less than than with blacks. Um, and the other is for uh, uh, whatever reasons, and I and I don't mean that in any way except to say that there are many reasons. There's there's the visibility question. There's also the genocide question. Um, uh, American Indians are not posing the kind of social and political um, problems in the 1950s and 60s, and I think even today, that um, the question of, 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 of race relations around whites and blacks are. Um, and so, you know, and, and this is, so this is where I think Arendt can be a little <laughs> hard, uh, uncaring, and she would, will clearly say that. She's writing, you know, she writes, she's like, look, I'm not into empathy. I'm into trying to think things through. Um, she, she doesn't like the word empathy. Um, she says that the issue here is not about blacks. It's about the fail, the future of the American Republic. Um, she uh, thinks Tocqueville was right, that the greatest danger to the American Republic, the idea of a, of a republic based in equality and freedom that was not a nation state, was the crime of slavery and its aftermath. Um, she calls it the foundational or fundamental crime uh, of the United States. And she thinks that um, it was inconsistent with the uh, founding of the country, and that um, in order to uh, uh, rectify that, we need political solutions. Um, uh, um, for all the genocidal harms that came to the American Indians, they weren't excluded from voting or participation by the Three-Fifths Clause. As I understand it, and um, they uh, were but, they? Uh, they they weren't excluded, but they weren't considered they citizens weren't. or even people until the late nineteenth century. Right, but by the but but by the time she's writing, um, they had politically integrated the few of them that were left um, in a way that uh, had not happened to blacks largely because of the particular constitutional uh, um, 
horrors in which the way that blacks were um, exempted from the, 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 the fundamental idea of equality and freedom in the American Constitution. And to her, that not only was a horror for blacks, which it was, but is uh, 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 an existential question for the United States, uh, as she understands it. And um, what she's arguing here is that that can only be repaired through political action, not through social action. By politically rectifying this, the, the, the situation, um, uh, not by attempting to do away with discrimination. This goes back to Paul's points. Um, now, you know, we all know the arguments for uh, t social attempts to rectify discrimination, that if you start at, z at line zero and the other person starts at, you know, the 10-yard line, and then you say start, it's not an equal race, clearly. And um, I think that there are absolutely necessary uh, um, interventions that need to be made to increase um, the social uh, educational and economic equality in the country. And I don't think Arendt would, would disagree with that. In fact, I don't think there's anything in her essay to, to challenge that. Um, she's simply arguing that we have to act politically. And um, if we confuse political equality with social equality, we risk actually increasing the resentments and therefore furthering the problems, the racial problems in the country. Um, but it's a good question about the Indians, but I, I think that the, the difference is that there's not a history of the political, constitutional political exclusion um, in the same way. Um, it's also just practically not the problem that um, the race problem became. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Hi, Roger. You said the political thing, and I, I really wanted to talk about something else, but since that was your last uh, phrase is there. Remember, the voting wasn't that available to people who wanted to change things in the South uh, at the time. There was a whole bunch of, uh, you know, voting rights were not generally available. So making a political change was not just a matter of doing it. It was a matter of changing a, a number of segregated uh, uh, situations. I just want to get back to the schooling part here where she's Patrick, saying. Patrick, let me just say that's still true today. Oh, and sure, sure. We're still fighting those battles. <laughs> of course you are. And I agree with you that there's an, at, in this day and age that's economic segregation, not necessarily legal or what have you. We realize what's going on. Um, in her here, she talks about um, the fact that education is compulsory uh, and so on as taking the right away from the parents to do it by themselves if they couldn't afford homeschooling. Uh, but she said, makes a statement here. Uh, all that involves not only the content of the child's education, not the context. The problem with that sentence is the context was the education when you're in a segregated community. When you were putting the children into the kind of schools that were being used uh, in those days, you were educating them as to their place in the hierarchy of, of humanity. That was just one point I wanted to make about that. There's the other place here where, uh, toward the end, where she, where she gives you her conclusion about uh, uh, fighting uh, school segregation. The conflict between a segregated home and a desegregated school between family prejudice abolishes in one stroke both the teacher's and parent's authority. I'm curious as to what is a segregated home that she meant at that time. Anyway, that's it, Roger. I got to... Yeah, so, I mean, those there's, there's are actually really important points. And, and let me say, um, the context-content distinction that Patrick brings up, you know, what she means by it is that education for her is about as she defines it in another essay, Crisis in Education, is about guiding or leading people into the, the public world. It's about teaching them the facts. It's about teaching them the tradition. Um, and that um, she sees it as not a political uh, endeavor. Um, uh, Patrick uh, very rightly 
uh, I think, suggests that, uh, especially in a country like the United States, um, segregated education um, is not just content, but also context. And, and, and so I just want to point out, um, Hannah Arendt wrote this in the late 1950s, early 1960s, it was published a little later. Um, uh, at the time she wrote it, many African Americans agreed with her, right? I mean, Bell Hooks was against forced desegregation, as was um, Du Bois a little earlier, on the idea that African Americans would be um, educated better where, in places where they were uh, wanted and not where they were made to feel inferior. And, um, and, you know, she and they argued that we should make better schools, et cetera. And if people wanted to integrate schools, let them do it, but not force it. Um, I don't know if it was a good argument then. I think at this point, it's a, it's beside the case. Nobody is arguing for integrate for segregated schools right now. And I can't imagine Arendt would be today. I mean, this is not a current debate. Uh, the, the, it's over. Um, and at this point, to argue for segregated schools, I think would be, um, you know, would be illegitimate. Uh, and she would see it that way, I would hope, although I, I can't speak for her. Um, I, I think the point is to, to understand the rationale for her argument, not because we want to rehash the argument about segregated schools, but because I think it applies to other uh, attempts to think about um, how we talk about and address real racial inequalities uh, that continue to exist today. Um, uh, when she talks about segregated homes, as um, she did, she simply means that uh, there were homes uh, where people uh, lived in, uh, where, 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 the, where the view, I'm sorry about this, uh, was one of segregation. And um, and 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 those and for those people, for those children to be brought up with parents who believe in education and segregation and then sent to school where they don't will create enormous tension in those um, in the between the parents and the children, uh, which will create these kind of resentments that um, she worried would be dangerous. So Hi, Roger. Uh, Oh, uh, can I say something? Uh, I just wanted to say uh, that. Uh, I don't know who's talking. Important. Who's talking? Oh, John, can you speak up or closer to your mic? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd just like to say that at the top of uh, page 194, there's a, a sentence or a phrase that I think is was really critical to the way I I read this article, and I've read it many times, and that was where it says that. Uh, I would feel that the very attempt to start you know, desegregation in education and in schools had not only and very unfairly shifted the burden of responsibility from the shoulders of adults to those of children. That's that's all I wanted to say because I think that you know that made so, you know so much in a sense to me that uh, you know the analysis that she offers is is very illuminating. You know, but that's the essential the kernel of the whole thing as far as I'm concerned. So it's an interesting point, and I, but I, I might disappoint you here, John, because that's probably, that's the one um, point in her essay that she uh, uh, came to uh, believe that her critics were right in and she uh, said she was wrong in. Um, uh, the, the writer, um, uh, Ralph Ellison, uh, wrote her a letter actually wrote, uh, wrote, was interviewed in um, the book, uh, Who Speaks for the Negro by Robert Penn Warren. And in that interview, uh, he said that Hannah Arendt, uh, in saying that the uh, African-American families who had sent their children uh, into the desegregated schools had, in a sense, used their children to fight their battles for them and, um, and, 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 sh and shouldn't have done so, in saying that she missed, uh, misunderstood the African American experience in the United States, which was one in which um, sacrifice uh, was, and the idea of sacrifice in the name of 
um, your race and, and, and advancement was part of the necessary education of every young student and every young uh, African-American. And that um, this was not uh, uh, an abuse of children, but part of their education. And she um, publicly, uh, well, she then wrote to Ellison when she read that and said, I hadn't understood that. You're right. And I was wrong. So I, I think the general idea that you shouldn't use children to fight your values, your battles, she agrees with. But she, she came to at least accept uh, the possibility. And in fact, it came to say she thought it was right that this may be something that in the uh, experience of African-American culture in the United States um, was actually not uh, um, an abuse, but actually uh, um, a necessary uh, um, step. So she did admit she was wrong on that issue. Um, that's the only part of the essay that I know she was challenged on that she admitted that she was wrong on. And um, there may be others, but that's the one I know. Um, I see there's a couple of written questions. Uh, are there other, let me, if I can, I can look at one. Um, someone writes, well, Bob Meyerson writes, there is a distinction between equality and opportunity that needs to be made. If we understand the education question as one of opportunity, then the claim for sorting education into the social realm seems to be an error. Um, so I think that's correct. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's correct. Uh, uh, her, her argument, right, is that if you're concerned about opportunity, uh, the, uh, the, the, the requirements are that you get rid of legal segregation and that you make schools better for all people whether they're white segregated schools, black segregated schools, or integrated schools. And so um, from her point of view, uh, there's, if opportunity is the issue, um, forced desegregation is not the, uh, it may be one path to achieve it, but she thinks it's not the only. Just to fill the space, I thought what I missed in, in this art, article essay was any, references that she might have had toward her experience in Germany with the discrimination against Jews and all that entailed. I was, it's funny that it didn't seem to, uh, she didn't seem to uh, uh, get, get, uh, get it into, into the article, which I thought was, I thought she might have some, some empathy uh, for the situation based on her own personal experience and the experience of Jews at the time in, in Germany when she was growing up. Not sure if I can make it. Bob, you want to give that another try? I'm not sure if I can be heard, but um, the, the reason perhaps she didn't draw upon her experience in Germany is because it was so different from the American experience. The, uh, the purpose of the Nazi policies was, was not to exclude, but to exterminate ultimately. And uh, earlier in the discussion today, we were hearing the distinction between the nation state and the American experience. And by the way, Canada ought to be included in that. But um, I, I don't think her lack of allusion to the Jewish experience really is, is telling uh, on the questions at hand. What I wonder, Bob, is there another question that her experience that she's talking about, which is schooling,
Uh, whatever about the anti-Semitic climate in which she was uh, growing up, her schooling was pretty good. And that might underlie some of her views about the idea of uh, the parents' rights to schooling or uh, educating their children in their own way and all. So I think if you jump into the 30s, we're talking about a different uh, issue and context rather than the schooling of children. I'm not so sure about that myself. I think that really what's so remarkable about, about Hannah Arendt is that her uh, her defense of the individual's freedom allows for situations that we would all agree are hateful. So the discrimination in the home, and I would imagine the anti-Semitism in a, uh, a German national socialist home, she is saying that people have a right to that or that uh, it's it would be worse to intervene to stop it as long as the, the line is drawn on legal issues. And that's t a, an amazing uh, consistency and troubling uh, to, to the common sense of, of the hearers. This essay has a multitude of subjects beyond its main content that are extremely interesting and worthy of much deeper discussion and thought. Among them is the, the idea of what education is uh, and also the relationship between parent and child and the differences between the 1950s. What's happened in the last 65 years, I think is crucial to the discussion. I guess what I had in the back of my mind when I mentioned the German experience is the fact that your education is really an education. It tells you something about who you are, how you are, and and what your uh, what your expectations can be, and and all the other parts of it. That's all. I I thought she didn't seem to appreciate, didn't seem to indicate in this particular essay. Apparently, she wrote in other essays about it, but in this one, I'm, we're talking about 1959, I understand that. And, and uh, But anyway, uh, maybe there wasn't enough room to mention it, or she didn't seem to think there was enough room. Well, the trajectory of the educational system in Germany after 1933 was uh, to, to exclude Whereas the trajectory of American education in the late 1950s was going the opposite direction to include. So I think they're very different experiences. Plus, uh, Arendt left uh, Germany early in 33. So uh, her personal experience would have been very different from the experience of Jews after 33. Bob, I thought there was anti-Semitism in Germany long before 1933. Maybe I'm incorrect. I'm not... Well, no, you're you're correct, but there was anti-Semitism everywhere, even in this country. But uh, we're talking more about policies and uh, legal prohibitions against participation. And despite uh, the anti-Semitism in Germany, there were many leading uh, philosophers, for example, Ernst Cassira and uh, uh, Cohen, um, who were successful in Germany uh, decades prior to 33. I'd like to maybe come back to what Howard was saying and consider some of the, the differences um, between education maybe where it's sort of education now is so tied to, to labor and the economy much more so than to politics. Um, 
or or even sort of the social sphere and wondering if anyone has thoughts on that. I'm just wondering if I'm anyone sorry. can hear me now again or not. Yes. I, I apologize. Go go ahead, Cynthia. I just I've had trouble speaking for some reason, but go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um I was just I kind of wanted to make some comments that kind of bring it to to the current situation. Um I'm a preservation and neighborhood planner in Kansas City and I um really hone in on this um this essay in the last couple of years because it really is um, it parallels one of the neighborhoods I'm working in where the city the, the school district has decided to um, has fought with the neighborhoods to close a school and ironically um, the schools the two schools one's named after Wendell Phillips the abolitionist and the other's named after Crispus Attucks and so I'm seeing that this article or this essay is is more alive and well than not, and that the forced segregation of that we're still dealing with the 1960s policies of busing and the illusion of integration, which I will contend as a planner that it was on an illusion because schools were still, in, at least in Kansas City, were heavily segregated and remain that way and are increasingly and politically being segregated still. So, I mean, this is what I'm seeing on the ground, you know, working with in predominantly African-American neighborhoods, and, you know, with the grandparents who actually lived with the initial federal policies and then going through what we're going through now, which is, is it is a mirror, but but almost to a higher degree. Um, so I, I think I, I've heard a bunch of the comments and I apologize for my network issues. Uh, it's never happened before. Um, I, uh, I'm thrilled you guys kept the conversation going. And I think what Cynthia said at the end um, makes a lot of sense. It's it's part of what I think I was trying to say, and, and she said it much better, um, about the fact that the warnings that RN offered uh, about the dangers of forced desegregation have, if not been true, because I'm not sure they're all true, they haven't, the, the, the hope of desegregation um, uh, has, has not come to pass. I think there's a parallel here between her warnings about um, the idea of Israel which she supported the creation of Israel very strongly and never criticized um, the creation of the state of Israel. Um, but she was opposed to the idea of the creation of the state of Israel as a Jewish state, precisely on the idea that as a Jewish state, Palestinians would have, um, and, and others, non-Jews, would always be second-class citizens. And she worried that no matter how generous the intentions were, um, a Jewish state would always would 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 inevitably tend towards um, a nationalist model in which there were first class and second class citizens, and um, in many ways her worries about um, forced desegregation and the attempt to um, impose uh, um, uh, social values um, are similar to her worries about um, uh, the dangers of a Jewish state or any nation state. And I, we didn't talk much about it, but I do encourage you to read the last few pages of the essay um, in which she really goes into um, a discussion of states' rights, which is a very unpopular view today. And it was an unpopular view among liberals when she did it. But, and her point is not to uh, defend the arguments of those who are states' writers the content of what they're arguing, but she makes an argument which is actually a core argument of her book um, on revolution, which is that the essential innovation and greatest achievement of the United States was to emerge not as a nation state, but as a state in which instead of one sovereign nation, there were multiple sovereigns, not only the executive, legislator, and judiciary, 
but all the states, but also more importantly for her, the county governments, the local governments, the town governments. And it was that local series of multiple powers that each competed with each other, which prevent, which on the one hand energized the populace to be um, free, and on the other hand prevented any one power from becoming sovereign and dominant. And um, and she saw that as the great uh, achievement of the United States, uh, and she worried that we were losing it through the increased federalization and nationalization uh, of our political structure. And, 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 and that this uh, attempt to impose national standards uh, is part of it. It's important to remember, she says, look, if people want to send the kids to integrated schools, we should encourage it. And we should encourage them to try and convince their neighbors that it's a good thing, but we shouldn't impose it. And I think that, fi I, I think that fits with what Cynthia is saying. If you talk to people and engage them and explain to them why they should go to the school you think they should go to, they may come to agree with you. But if you impose it on them, you end up creating all sorts of resentments um, that, that lead to unexpected problems. Uh, I don't know if that's what you had in mind, Cynthia, or if any of that sounds um, familiar. No, it it is. Yeah, I mean, it's that it's that lack of. It, it, it's definitely the imposition of. Okay, here's the decision that's been made overhead, and and you know from the top down, and not always um, considering who is there in the neighborhood culture and and broader culture of the city. Um, because I mean, even like different, different neighborhoods have different, different cultures. And so, um, that is what, you know, that we're still struggling with that to this day. Um, and, you know, on a daily basis with, you know, as I see it. Um, so yes, yes. Okay. And it's also not, it's, you know, not considering the fact that, um, these, these boundaries that created certain parts of different cities were intentionally, you know, they were, they were intentional ghettos, um, you know, which was enabled with the zoning acts. So how do you, how do you break through that? Well, we still haven't broken through it, quite frankly. Thank you. I mean, we're out of time. Uh, <laughs> and I again, apologize for our technical difficulties. Those of you, since all of you uh, on this are members, I just want to remind you, you're, you're, you're able to attend the conference we're having on Real Talk, Difficult Questions About Race, Sex, and Religion in October, on October 28th and 21st. Uh, for those of you too far away, it'll be live broadcast, and I, I hope you uh, tune in for some of it. Um, I really appreciate your uh, having a thoughtful and engaged discussion about what's obviously a, a difficult and at times controversial text. So. Um, Thank you very much. I hope you keep enjoying reading Arendt, and we'll see you next month.